Chapter 12, Input and Output Data Files. Hello everyone and welcome to Browning's Introduction to Programming with Python, 5th edition. Um, what we're talking about in Chapter 12 really is uh, persistent data. So by persistent data, um, really what we're talking about here is when you save something to a variable, and normally when you close the program it's destroyed, released from memory whereas um, we can actually write this out to a flash drive, a hard drive, um, whatever kind of secondary storage or long-term storage then when we start the program back in theory you could reread the variables back in um, if you were you know word processor you're writing a resume well if you didn't save it to an actual file when you shut the word processor down the file or there would be no file the data would be gone you wouldn't want to retype your resume over and over again. So certainly this is uh, handy. We might think about this um, in regards to a video game as well. An example of a video game uh, that might use persistent data, if you had a high score, you finish the game and you want to save the high score the next time you start the game, then it says who the high scores were. Well, that had to be written out to some secondary persistent storage. So, um, let's see. Let us look a little bit uh, back as far as um, different types of d persistent data. You might have text or ASCII data, plain text or ASCII, AS, American Standard Code for Information Interchange. Just a plain text file that you can edit with a text editor. Or it might be in binary format, such as a JPEG image or an audio file, video file, or something of that nature, which um, certainly wouldn't be able to really edit with a text editor. Um, and we'll look at working with both of those with Python. Um, as far as um, types of file, files that you might uh, deal with, um, how data is represented, obviously it's going to be ones and zeros ultimately, you know, that on and off that we talked about before. Um, groups of four bytes are known as a nibble, and then you have eight bits to a byte for standard, you know, uh, data storage that we're dealing with. Um, we covered this in previous chapters, but uh, obviously want to mention it again. Now, there are um, different word sizes. There are some 7-bit machines um, as opposed to 8-bit, which is fairly standard. And you might have something uh, bigger with, a, say, a SunSpark platform or, you know, a larger, more industrial-style computer. All right, let's see. Binary files and text files, again, we might say that uh, JPEG picture, um, audio files, music files, things like that would be binary. Um, text files, uh, web pages, HTML, XML, um, rich text format, RTF, those might be examples of really text files. So to create a simple batch file, let's go back to creating a simple text file. And this is DOS Windows. In Linux, Unix, or Mac, it'd be similar, but not exactly the same. So this is going to be for a Windows machine only, and something that you can get to a command prompt. Uh, that, that's going to be important as well. But to create a simple batch file, batch files have a BAT extension. Um, with Windows machines, you have COM and EXE, they're executable programs. And then batch files are actually also executable or runnable. In the Linux uh, Mac world, you actually have to flag the files as executable, um, but it doesn't really matter what the extension is. Uh, but we're dealing with Windows right now. So what a batch file does, or a BAT file, is you can have commands in it, DOS commands, or Windows programs that will actually run when you actually execute the batch program. So if you had a file called go.bat, and you typed in go to command prompt, anything on individual lines that was an actual program or command it would actually execute. So we will try the next hand on by creating a simple batch file because we're going to get to this we're going to actually run some Python programs from within a batch file. So that's the madness behind what we're doing. Um, you'll need to get to a command prompt ideally run it as an administrator. Um, copy con test.bat That's step number two. Copy is a command. You can copy files or you can copy from the con console. So it's copying from the console to a file that it's going to create called test.bat. Um, you're going to type in the command dir in the actual file and then type in or press control z 
to close that stream to that file and create that file. So at this point you're going to have created a file called test.bat and from the directory that you're in where you created it if you typed in test it would actually do a directory of all the files and folders that are in that directory and it would show you what's there. Try that out and then hit play to continue. Alright, let's change it. <clears throat> We're going to create a new batch file. You can give it a different name but we'll try some different DOS commands. DIR with a slash to the right W, Linux, Unix, Mac, it's going to be to the left um, and slightly different, but um, slash in Windows is going to be to the right, DIR slash W, or wide directory listing or slash P, a page at a time, will show you that directory but in just a different format. Try that out, run it and execute it. Um, we will build on this. If you're not familiar with DOS commands, I would strongly recommend you go to a site such as Computer Hope or you might go to some other places. But um, try a different command today. It's just like learning a language. You are, in fact, learning a language. Try a different DOS command today, and eventually you'll get comfortable with it. And what you'll find is that when you get comfortable with DOS commands, you'll get more comfortable with Mac and Unix and Linux commands as well, and you can branch into those. Because really, a Linux command prompt, in you know, my humble opinion, is like a DOS prompt on steroids. Um, so try that out with the second one. Hit play when you're ready to continue. Okay. In programming, you can access a file sequentially, start from the beginning, one line at a time, and go to the end, or randomly, maybe if you're going to a DVD or a CD, you can go to any place you want to in any order. All right. Um, so two different ways that you can access a file. Uh, sequential access might be an old school VCR tape that you're playing on your granddad or grandmom's TV. Whereas a DVD or a DVR might be an example of sequential or a random access where you can get to anything that you want to. All right, when you're creating a text file, you can create a brand new file and write to it. You can open a file for read only just to read from it, or you can open a file that exists and add or append to it. Um, when you work with writing to a text file, there are a couple of key things you want to be familiar with. You're going to have to create the file generally, define the variables that you're going to write to it, write to the file, and then make sure you close the stream or the connection to the file. If you've ever shut down a computer inappropriately or power's gone off, batteries died, any number of different things, you restart the machine and it generally gives you a nasty message like, the machine has been started inappropriately, there are open files. There seems to have been a problem when the machine restarted. Would you like just to clear out some of the temporary files, blah, 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 blah. Well, it's because you had a stream open to certain files when the machine was running, uh, you know, for temp storage, temporary files, things, things behind the scenes that you never really see. And when you turn the machine off, those streams can't be closed properly. So when the machine restarts, it finds these .tmp files or whatever they happen to be named, and it says, hey, wait a minute, there's been a problem. And generally, if the operating system is pretty good, it tries to clear those out for you. So, the next example, we're going to write to a file with Python. And notice that we're going to give the file name as a alphanumeric, so we're using raw underscore input for Python 2, where we actually tell it, hey, what do we want the file name to be? You want to specify the whole file name. If you wanted it to be something like, you know, my data, you know, as a text file, you'd have to say mydata.txt. You're making a web page, mypage.html. Um, tell the user what we want them to do. Specifically type QUIT in all capital letters to quit. All right, the command to open a file is open and it takes two arguments. It wants to know the name of the file to open and how you want to open it. You want to open it for writing, appending. Um, and we'll see that here in a minute. The text that we want to put into it. This is your variables, okay? Um, so this is what we're actually writing to. Then we have a while loop. While it's not true that the user has entered quit, which they have not yet, then we have raw input. We want the user to enter some data. This is just going to, you know, append to this text file, and it's going to check it. It's going to say, hey, have they entered quit yet? If they haven't entered quit, then keep on, you know, grabbing the data. When it's finally done, uh, if it is equal to quit, then close the file. So we have file.close. Remember, we said we had to close the stream. 
and then break out of the loop. Remember we said break stops the termination of a loop in a previous chapter. Then we're out of the loop at this point. Write is a command with file and it's going to take the text file, that variable, it's going to write it out to the actual file that we created and then we want to put in a hard return so it has a nice little clean empty line at the bottom of it and then close the whole file stream. Try that out and then hit resume and we will build from there. Alright, so to read from a file, very similar process you just did, you will need to make sure that you have a file to read from. So in this next example, we're going to take a file called foo.txt. If you don't have that, you can start your favorite Notepad, uh, Notepad++, which I highly recommend you downloading and using if you don't have that already, or any kind of a text editor, but it's going to be a plain text file. You could use Word, or LibreOffice, or OpenOffice. Just make sure you save as a plain text file. But it's going to want, in the same directory as your Python program that we're creating this, a file called foo.txt. Note that I did say that this file needs to be in the same directory as your Python program that you're running. So wherever you're going to save this Python program, you want to make sure this text file is in there because it's not looking to another folder or directory on your computer. Could you say C colon backslash blah 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 and give it a directory path to where it is? Yes, you could. In this case, it's looking for it locally. So it opens it R for reading. We have a for loop. We know for loops can iterate over loopable objects or iterable objects. So it's going to loop over our program, INP, that has our text data in it. It's going to print out each individual line. Then it, again, going to close the stream. Try that out, and then we will resume. All right, so the format is file name, mode, and then buffering, how you want to um, you know, read that. Again, some of those are optional. Um, you could use A to append to an existing file. It would not recreate it. It would just add to it. Uh, let's see. B -b 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 let's append to a file and just try that out. Okay, so we're going to assume that we have a file name that exists that we can um, add to. If it's not there, this is you know obviously going to crash. But give it a file name there. If you wanted to use foo that you just used in the previous example, that would certainly work. Tell the user what we want them to do to be done. Quit, all capital letters, Q-U-I-T. And then open it for writing. Um, and then if you look over on page 109-ish, uh, we have a while loop that's going to take our text, write it out. Again, it checks for quit. Add it to the file. When we're totally done, put a new line in. Do it again. When we're, when we're totally completed, close the stream. Then what we'll do is we'll go into append mode, append to what's there already, open it for reading, read it, show it to the user. So we create the file, append to it, read it, show it to the user. Hit play when you're ready to continue. So as a challenge, you might create an application that reads a string from the user, saves it to a file, and then reads a string back to the user from the file. All right try that out that might be fun to reinforce what you just learned if you want to work with binary files you can add a B to the W so you're going to write it but you're going to write it in binary format in this particular example remember that each item in the ASCII table has a decimal value okay so we could write the number out and then we could convert it back with CHR to an ASCII value display it to the screen all right bin or binary is kind of a universal for a binary file you'll see that used a lot um, if you have a Cisco Linksys router different routers firmware you may see that there's some replacement firmware you can get that has a BIN extension okay so it's just a binary you know operating system file try that out and then we will resume with pickle alright pickling tastes good on sandwiches kind of good as a snack. However, pickling data is also handy when you want to preserve the original type of the data that you're storing. If you recall that we said you could store numeric data as a string, but it's not numeric, numeric at that point. It's string data, even though it might still be like the number 65 or something. So with pickle, 
you can actually preserve what it was supposed to be. Um, pickle example number one and then pickle example number two, unpickling data, um, will unpickle it back to its original format. So instead of we convert it to a string, we convert it back to numeric data example. Try that out and hit play and we will move on. All right. Uh, seek and tell are interesting because uh, they're a little similar to what we did when we were searching through text files. All right. Um, several uh, interesting built-in file methods some of you such as write however seek and tell are two other interesting ones tell returns the files current position and seek sets the files current position um, if you were open a file for a pending you would be positioned at the end of the file ready to add more so with these two you can control and identify where you are in a file all right uh, tell has a return value it tells you where the, the position is seek does not it goes to a certain spot so you might try out the fun with seek and tell and then if you look as a summary after you finish that you'll see some of the flags that are available in reading and writing a text file certainly this is an important chapter though because you would want persistent data and what you might do is go back in some of your previous programs and add in the ability maybe to write out uh, you know a little bit of the data um, when the program finished. Uh, maybe it does a math function and it writes the score out when it adds a few numbers together as well as displays it to the screen. Or maybe you have an if statement and you let them do a little math with the program and then it asks a question. Would you like to save this data to a text file or not? But the more you go back and modify your programs and add some things in, the more it's going to make more sense to you. Use comments um, extensively because I think they'll help you out when you go back and look at your code. Um, check out the activities at the end of the chapter, um, work on those, they will extend your learning. In the next chapter 13 we will be talking about classes and inheritance, object-oriented programming, very exciting chapter and look forward to talking to you then. Have a nice day.